Well, um, you know, welcome everyone and uh, feel free to say hello in the chat room and let us know where you're joining us from if you have a lighthouse connection. Um, so tonight our presentation is called The Allure of Maine's Lighthouses and it's an illustrated talk by Bob Trapani. I'm Jen Pai, the director of the Monhegan Museum. And as most of you know, the museum here on Monhegan is in the Monhegan Island Light Station. What you might not know is that the beacon on Monhegan was first lit on July 2nd, 1824. So in honor of the 200th anniversary of Monhegan Light, we're focusing on our lighthouse and several ex exhibitions and programs in 2024. So, Remember that if you're going to be joining us for virtual trivia in April, um, April 11th, I think it is, that uh, knowing your facts about Monhegan Light might be in your best interest. Uh, so tonight we're going to hear from Bob Trapani Jr. Bob's been working in the field of lighthouse nonprofit management for 26 years. And since 2005, he served as the director of the American Lighthouse Foundation which is the steward of 13 lighthouses in New England. He is also president of the West Quaddy Head Lighthouse Keepers Association. And in addition to his nonprofit work, Bob actively serves as a lighthouse technician with the Coast Guard Aids to Navigation team and helps to maintain lights and fog signals from Port Clyde to the Canadian border. So Bob is truly passionate about lighthouses, but he's also interested in writing and photography. With his family, he's combined these different pursuits and in his recent publication, or combined them in recent publications, one is called Gleams and Whispers, Maine's Lighthouses and Their Allure, and another is called Beacons of Wonderment, A Fascination with Maine Lighthouses. And on his family's website, Moments in Maine and Maine Lights Today magazine, you can learn more about these things. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Bob. Thank you so much for coming to talk with us tonight. Oh, thank you, Jen. And thank you for everybody who's in attendance tonight. I'm really excited about this. Uh, we all love lighthouses and I've seen lighthouses from the utilitarian side, from the preservation side, and who doesn't like to visit a lighthouse and photograph a lighthouse. I try to take all those passions and put them together and make it a journey unto itself because each one of us has our own journey. And tonight's presentation, I hope that you will enjoy some glimpses into a journey that I hope just continues for a while on. But uh, Jen, if you're okay, I'll share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so main lighthouses and their allure. Over the last two decades plus, I've experienced lighthouses from the perspectives of preservation and maritime utility. I've immersed myself in the history of lighthouses and endeavored to capture their alluring essence through photography. Still, I wanted something more. There's an, an inextinguishable desire within me to better understand the myriad of meanings that embody lighthouses and why they stir our spirits. With experience and history by my side, I set out on a journey with no end to find solitude of thought, to discern what cannot be seen by the eye, but rather felt only by the heart. My latest books, Gleams and Whispers and Beacons of Wonderment are my personal journals of discovery. So come, let's sit down and talk together for a little while and ponder our love for Maine's lighthouses. And as Jen said, it, it, a lot of this centers around my family and I wouldn't have it any other way watching the kids grow up around lighthouses since they were born, all of them. And it's just been a great family memory, but also just great to see and meet all the people along the way. It's uh, been an amazing journey. And I have served as the uh, director for the American Lighthouse Foundation since 2005. And what an experience that is to work with a, a great group of volunteers. Uh, there was a, there's about 300 volunteers that helped the American Lighthouse Foundation with lighthouses from uh, Palmham Rocks today in Rhode Island, all the way to Little River Light in Cutler. And I've also had 24 years experience as a lighthouse technician working as an auxiliary for the U.S. Coast Guard since 2010 being attached to uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Aids and Navigation Team Southwest Harbor. 
And there's two things I've come to realize. If you asked a dozen people what lighthouses mean to them, you may very well hear 12 different answers. And I think that's a fascinating part. And then one can visit a lighthouse time and again, but no matter how familiar the place may seem, there are always new encounters for the mind and heart to absorb. I like to think there is no, you might visit a lighthouse a hundred times and each one will offer you a little something different. So I seek to let, let's see here, I've got to move some things so I can read this here. Okay. I seek to let times of reflection flow, enable what's heartfelt to manifest and capture a smattering of thoughts that inspire. Maybe it crystallizes, maybe it doesn't. No matter, I believe in staying curious and staying adventurous in all things of the mind and heart. So I wonder and write. So the shadow of Portland had light here. Within it, nothing is found and yet everything is revealed, depending on your perspective. There are times when I'm not sure what I'm hoping to find along the lighthouse path. Their gilded past is adrift and the present whispers promises that surely must fall short of the heart's yearnings. Yet the quenchless query beckons and so to the lights I journey. And this is Ram Island. I guess I should have said in, in, in the, well, the first one I did say was Portland, but this is Ram Island in East Booth Bay. And it's just, uh, this path here, this wooden path through the lighthouse really fascinated me as I was, as we were working the light that day, I thought it was something worth capturing. And one of the things that really inspires me, like so many people I think that are gonna be on this uh, meeting today is just the history, the history of these lights. Uh, this picture was taken a few years back at Isle of Ho. So I looked for doors into history at every opportunity. And when they open, I walk through them. So you have Fort Point light, in the reflecting in the oil house door window there and on the right, or at least my right here, uh, at his Petit Manan Island Lighthouse. And we all know keeping a good light was often a family affair. Teamwork was essential. Um, it, it was husbands, wives, children, all taking part, not just in keeping the light, but just uh, their whole way of life. Just, especially if you were offshore at a lighthouse, so difficult and it required everybody pulling together. So when I'm out at the lights, I often find myself thinking about people who tended the lights, like Keeper William C. Williams and his wife, Mary Abby Williams at Boone Island, Clarence and Annette Schofield at Squirrel Point Light, Ida and Harry Dobbins at Bear Island Light Station. I love that picture of those two there on top of Bear Island's light. Archford and Bertha Haskins at Owl's Head Light, or Amanda and Eugene Coleman at Bass Harbor Head. And in both these pictures, I, I really found, I love the fact that there's the pets in the uh, in both of these photos, which I think is, is really important because lighthouses, as we know, have so much connection to pets as well. Herbie and Mabel Wasp with their children, for Fillmore, Winona, and Irwin at Libby Island Light Station. For those not familiar with Libby Island Light Station, it's down east at the entrance to uh, Machias Bay and a very difficult spot for, uh, to not only staff as a lighthouse keeper and, and reside there as a family, but one of the uh, more islands that had a lot of shipwrecks through the years. And then of course, keeper Thomas Orkey with his dog Sailor at Wood Island Light Station. Uh, there was a lot of these types of dogs. Sailor was certainly famous for this. You had Spot at Al's Head, you had Nemo at Heron Neck, you had, a, you had a bunch of different dogs that they, uh, they, they not only uh, could learn, I'll, I'll call it almost like a trick like this, learn to pull that bell and have the steamers or other vessels going by and, and them returning either with a horn or a bell themselves, uh, but also just the visitors that would come to the island. So the pets certainly made life at a lighthouse so much more entertaining. And of course, when you're out, uh, you think of, you, you think of, the, the history, who can forget Mary, uh, Maine's heroine, Abby Burgess uh, at Matinicus Rock and her keeping the lights for nearly a month on, on that one occasion when her father could not get back to, to the light station and also taking care of her family members, running low on rations. The whole story is just a, a tremendous inspiration to people today. And here we are, uh, a crew of us at, at Abby and Isaac's grave sites there in Spruce Head at Forest Hill Cemetery. It's always nice to be able to go and pay respects and also uh, show new folks who come to the area, uh, you know, some of our history. And of course, what's our lighthouse history without 
uh, recognized in somebody like Augustin Fresnel and his invention of the Fresnel lens in 1822, a French physicist who really just revolutionized lighthouses. And we cannot thank this gentleman enough. The amount of lives that were saved over the years for centuries, the last two centuries, will never be known. But he was certainly one of those heroes in the annals of lighthouse history. And just what you're, uh, if people are uh, looking at this, these are just spectrums of light on, uh, on the brick is at West Quaddy Head, uh, the spectrum of light coming from the third order Fresnel lens above. And on the right uh, was some spectrum of light on the fourth order lens at Owl's Head Light. I like to look for these types of things because it, it makes the uh, experience at a lighthouse so much more uh, remembering, remembering. Uh, and then there's also these like type of things. This is uh, an etching on the Whistle House. It's just an elevated floor in the Whistle House at Cape Elizabeth. And I find these things so cool. 1929 USLHS or United States Lighthouse Service. The fact that these types of things still exist is another spice of life for our, our experience at lighthouses. And anybody who's been in Dice Head Light in Castine will remember seeing this sign that is above the entryway from the vestibule into the tower itself, which again, is such a, such a cool thing. I also look for anything that remains from this history here at Doubling Point. This is the foundation of the first Doubling Point Lighthouse, so along the Kennebec River. So when they established the lighthouse in 1898, for whatever reason, uh, they did not put it in a position that if you were coming down from Bath, that you could actually see the lighthouse where they needed it most on the turn. And they did rectify that situation about a year and a half later, they moved it uh, about 500, 500 yards up river there towards a little closer to Bath where it is today. Um, but the foundation remains and it's an interesting uh, a relic you might say to say, why did the engineers choose that spot and only to find out, and he actually they moved it a year and a half later, but they knew rather quick off that this wasn't in the right position, so they did rectify that. This is at Libby Island, and it's a steam boiler for the uh, whistle that would have been at Libby Island. Such this equipment, a lot of this was so heavy and, and so cumbersome that they it never left the island, so it would be just discarded along the side. I look for things like that. Uh, they're slowly, like this piece of equipment is slowly fading away, uh, but it harkens back to another time. And of course, if you go to visit Portland Head Light and the, the uh, plaque there that talks about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and him supposedly sitting on this uh, stump and looking out and might it have been inspiration for the poem, The Lighthouse, you know, very well could have been. But just that story of Mr. Longfellow coming down from the city to visit the lighthouse keepers and probably just to clear his mind, but also to find inspiration for some of the uh, poem and prose that he would write. And of course, when we talk about history, it doesn't all have to be at the lighthouse sites. So much of our history is also in other uh, repositories like the Maine Lighthouse Museum in Rockland is a great example of that with all of the Fresnel lenses and other lighthouse artifacts that are there. Um, it's just wonderful that somebody like Ken Black who founded the Maine Lighthouse Museum was able to save so much so that we can enjoy today. Otherwise, a lot of this would have been lost. So we often mistakenly think that history stopped when the keepers and their families were removed from the lighthouses. History has not stopped. It may look different, but as long as the lights still stand and shine, new chapters are being written. I, this is Goat Island, for those not familiar. And this, this picture here really, when I saw the scene, I said I, I had to take this picture. The sidewalk stopped. And, and, and that to me represented the idea that history has not stopped because just beyond that sidewalk, there's the lighthouse. The Kenny Bunk Conservation Trust does a great job, uh, not only maintaining, but the public access and the programs they facilitate. The Coast Guard still maintains the light. So history is still happening at Goat Island. And of course, we are still making history. Um, this, was, uh, this was actually... houses in Maine. It's about 22 miles, 20, 22 to 25 from Rockland. And uh, it's, uh, 
one of those really remote places. You wonder how families actually uh, not so much survive, but how did they endure? How did they mentally and emotionally endure in places like this? And some loved it. And of course, lighthouses, their sense of place is unmistakable. It's part of why we love them. It's not just the lighthouse structures themselves, but it's it's their surroundings. Uh, this is a, a picture of Little River Light in Cutler, uh, which is uh, an overnight stay program in 15 acre island. And it's just on a beautiful day. You just, it's stunning to be able to look out over Grand Manan Channel, out to uh, the island to Grand Manan out there. And just, just the solitude of a place like Little River is amazing. But sense of places can also be found inside structures, around the structures. This was taken some years ago at Curtis Island. Like the uh, caretakers, the Conovers, were residing in the house for well over, well, for over three decades. And I remember coming down the stairs and seeing this scene along one of the windows there. And I said, I had to take that. It just, it was uh, the human touches that you find at lighthouses, even though they're not staffed anymore, of course, today. Sense of place here, this is a top at Moose Peak Light and on Mistake Island. And I gotta say, I don't know how the island got the name Mistake Island, but it is one of the most beautiful islands you'll ever be on. And I just, I, I love it. And I'm just like, what a name for an island so beautiful. But uh, it's, uh, for those not familiar, Moose Peak Light is about five miles southeast of Jonesport to give you some sort of uh, geographic sense of place. And then again, um, I love looking at shadows and I think about the, the shadow upon the keeper's house at Little River here uh, and how the keeper would have looked up at night and just tried to keep an eye on that light because it was a one family station, one keeper station. So uh, the keeper would not have been in the watch room so much as, but I would have kept an eye out from the windows. And I don't imagine keepers actually rested all that well through the night, just knowing that they could not let that light out. And then on the right is looking out from the keeper's house at Little River Light. And sense of place, wow. I mean, this one here, uh, obviously I'm zooming in on Egg Rock, which is near Bar Harbor with uh, Champlain Mountain behind it. But there is, you, there's no other dramatic scene in Maine that can match this in regards to, uh, you know, again, that idea of a sense of place. When you see that, it can only be Egg Rock near Bar Harbor. It's an it's a amazing scene. And lighthouses have guided mariners, but on occasion, they give directions to. It's a, It was more of a humorous take on this one, but Seguin Island, uh, which is home to Maine's only first order, Fresnel Lens. And it's just that sign, just, uh, I said, I have to have that picture. It's just, uh, just another one of those human interest type of things. Well, you have history, but you have weather. Weather's also a big fascination for me uh, with the lighthouses. I love being out all seasons with it and winter being my favorite, but uh, weather is, uh, is definitely a factor. It was a factor for the lighthouse keepers back in the day. It's a factor for us today. This picture was taken with some Arctic sea smoke on Penobscot Bay from the Rockland Breakwater. So I climbed over rockweed covered ledges, stared in the face of Northeast gales and trudged through waist high snow, searching for the many facets of the elusive meaning attached to lighthouses. Along the way, I've, I've obtained a deeper understanding in every new sight, sound, feel and smell of the Sentinels. And I know somebody could say, well, the smell of the lighthouse. And you know, actually there is, especially some of the offshore ones, when you go into these lights, there's, it's a combination of, I believe the fact that they've been shut up, there's not a lot of ventilation in them. So there's this moisture. And then also in some of them, there, you, it's an unmistakable diesel smell that still is actually there. And I think it's just because some it's in the brick and it's just, it's amazing. You, you could have your eyes closed or a blindfold on and somebody place you inside a lighthouse and you'd be like, that's a lighthouse. And of course, that connotation of a light in the storm. In this particular picture, I just loved being able to see it and how to take a, a capture of it. I, I'm outside of Rockland Breakwater Light looking at the VRB 25 and just the way the rain was playing along the panes and the little bit of distortion that it, it created um, there's these artistic moments that you come across when you visit lighthouses over and over. And it's part of what keeps it so fresh and new. And then looking out from the keeper's house at Marshall Point in, a, in the rain, and then being atop Pemiquid Point light with the fourth order lens reflecting, 
as the uh, big seas come ashore, and we've all seen some of the damage recently at Pemmicley Point, uh, I can, I remember a few occasions being in the top of Pemmicley Point during the storm, and just being amazed that when that, the thunderous sound of the sea, then when it explodes up in the air, and you wait like a half a second, you feel the lantern just getting pelted with the sea, and, the, and then you watch the spray go all the way out to the parking lot. It's a, it's a, a riveting experience. This picture was taken atop of West Quaddy Headlight during a storm. We were there servicing the light. I remember this day, it was like 50 knots sustained and gusting like 60, 65. And it was just really difficult to stand up outside. And I just could not believe it. I said, how many times were keepers up in the lantern just watching these kinds of scenes, uh, you know, the days before photography or, you know, and video, what they must have saw was amazing. And of course, uh, thunderstorms are also part of all of this. This was taken at Whitehead a couple years ago, and this storm was coming in, and it's just the leading edge of it. You knew you weren't going to be outside very long, but what a dramatic setting as the, as the uh, edge of the storm was coming over at Whitehead Island. And then working out of Al's head, because it's so elevated, I can go to the back side of the bluff and have a you know uninterrupted view of Penobscot Bay and to see the storms coming across the bay like this is just amazing. Here's another one coming out. It was coming out from Rockland out over the bay. And again, you don't have a lot of time. You watch these storms approach and it's the, the lightning and, and the heavy rain that's gonna, you know, is gonna come and the wind's gonna pick up, but it's for a few fleeting moments, it's a, it's a wonder to see. And of course, this is whaleback light in Kittery, the, the southernmost light in Maine. And it is a wave swept light. And it's just one of those lights that I look at and it takes a pounding. And because of the way it was built, um, it just continues to stand. And it, it's, again, imagine living inside something like this and imagine the sound and the, the waves hitting and the vibration and probably some during some big storms. I mean, we know keepers would have probably questioned, is this structure gonna hold? I'm sure that happened from time to time on some of the violent storms. And then this is looking out at Novel Light in York from uh, uh, Long Sands Beach. On this day, it was just uh, amazing to watch the seas roll in and the wind taking the top off of the, uh, of the waves as they were coming in. But, uh, and then of course, I'm zooming in on this because the lighthouse is a little bit of a distance from there. But it's the other part that's fun about this is to be able to try to frame lighthouses in, in a different context. And it's, uh, it's a challenge, but also keeps it always, uh, like I said, fresh. This is a, this is a sea breaking at, at Pemiquid Point. Uh, it's one of those things you always wanna be far enough back from the distance on this. Of course, in this case, I was in the lantern, so I, I didn't have to worry about that. But just to Matt, look at the height of that as it just breaks on the, uh, on the ledge there. and Pemiquit Point during a storm, a snowstorm. And I often think as I see this today, we don't worry about such things anymore, but a lot of you who know your lighthouse history will know that the lighthouse service regulations would not have permitted the glass to be frosted up with ice and snow, that the keeper would have had to been out there and, and making sure that those panes of glass were free of any of, the, uh, um, any of the elements that would have prevented the light from being seen at sea. On the left is Marshall Point light during a blizzard and it literally was a blizzard. That's it, an amazing place uh, during such weather. It, it's almost like during a really strong snowstorm, it almost suffocates the air. And you just, you just the wind is so strong, you can't see anything. All you hear is this howling. And, and then on the right, Al's headlight during a snowstorm. And what's really cool is to watch how the snow will move in different directions with the uh, Fresnel lens lighting up the atmosphere there right around the, the lighthouse. That's, uh, that's always uh, something that I, it's a sight to behold. This was taking at the Rockland Breakwater Lighthouse for those not familiar with it. What struck me about it was this piece of uh, rockweed or whatever, I believe it was rockweed that day. I couldn't really, I didn't really stand around to look at it that much, but it almost gave me the sense of an ominous feeling about you're there out there, you can't see anything. It's it's very cold. 
Um, sometimes out there, it's a combination of snow and sleet. So if you turn to face the Northeast, it just pelts your face and hurts. And it's just really complete isolation and, and desolation really came to mind when I saw this scene. And it was just something that I had to capture to, to help interpret the way I felt that day. And this was taken at the Kennebec River Range front light or the range lights, the rear light would have been in the distance there. And on this day, the snow was just gently falling and you could hear a pin drop. There was no sound, no cars, and it was so quiet. To me, it, was, it just was like pure tranquility. And it was like, if you could bottle that moment, I really wish I could have. And Al's headlight in, this was during one of the Northeast storms in recent years. And to, to watch that, I come down to the south side and I'll walk out at low tide. You always have, it has to be low tide. And I can walk out the south side to that and get that vantage point. And it just, uh, that's a, a terrific sight to be able to see. The lighthouse shines its light 100 feet above Penobscot Bay. This was taken at the Rockland Breakwater. It, it's stunned. I've seen it for a few times over the years, but each time I see it, I'm always amazed and I just can't believe it. The snow just, in this case, really just meets the water right there uh, after a big blizzard and just drifts off the golf course from the Samoset to depths of like, uh, gosh, 20 feet. You can't walk along what would normally be the path. You'd literally sink. You'd be, you'd be swallowed up by the snow. Um, you can generally get out if you walk along the fence and get out of, on top of the golf course to see the light at that point. But um, to, to be able to see the snow, it does what on a drift like that was just amazing. And then it was taken at Hendricks Headlight at the entrance to the Sheepscot River. And just this derelict uh, boat just washed up after a storm on one of the storms. And the boat itself obviously was nothing to look at, but what it did inspire in my mind was how many in the past, how many wooden schooners and other types of vessels would be washed ashore, drag anchor, um, blown ashore, their sails ripped apart and how many people were wrecked, ships were wrecked and people needed rescued. A lot of them didn't get rescued. A lot of could be rescued uh, for the uh, for those who had life-saving stations nearby uh, and Maine had, you know, had a few life-saving stations. Uh, you think about the surfmen going out and trying to rescue or the lighthouse keeper trying to help and do what they could. They were limited, but a lot of keepers, though the lighthouse service would not necessarily encourage it, uh, just because they didn't want the keeper to be incapacitated or worse and then not be able to have the light on. We know from all the history, lighthouse keepers, if they could help, they did. And this was taken after a storm at Squirrel Point Light. And what I really loved about this was just the way I could zoom in on this and capture the back door to the keeper's house and just connect the fact that at one point families lived at these types of places. And again, what did they see? All the beauty. Um, it, it, it had to be something that they would never forget. And then this taken at Pembroke Point Light. It's always interesting to get out over the rocks, something like this. It's uh, it's you, you have to step carefully. Uh, it's just, but to see that scene, it looks like cotton to me. And uh, that's just the beauty. You think about how violent or how cold a storm can be as it's happening. And then after it goes the next day, if the sun comes out, the beauty that is unveiled from it. And so it's just the flip side of that coin. And this was a, a Brown's headlight at the uh, entrance, the Western entrance to the Fox Island thoroughfare. And the sugar loaves were in front here in the foreground as we're on the ferry and passing by. And it was just one of those scenes where it was so interesting to be able to see the lighthouse with the sugar loaves in the foreground. And for those not familiar, the sugar loaves are an interesting rock formation. It's pretty large. Uh, right at the entrance off of Brown's Headlight. And for years in the Old Coast Pilot, they would reference this, um, these rocks here as a, uh, as a landmark to know where you were at as you were approaching the bay. So it was one of those things though, it wasn't a navigational aid, but certainly the Coast Pilot would let the mariners know, if you see this, this is where you're at. This is one of those ones where you, when I say waist high snow, I remember this day, the drifts were so much at Bass Harbor Head um, we would be servicing this light on this day. I remember being up to my waist in snow and wondering, was I even going to be able to walk through it? Uh, but uh, it's always fascinating, again, the quiet after a snowfall like this and to see the beauty. And when nobody's around, it's uh, it really, it's, it's solitude personified. And of course, there's ice. 
is that Marshall Point Light, uh, ice plays a factor in so much of uh, winter weather. And in this case, it was just ice on the rocks, but uh, there was also, and we'll see some of these pictures, ice can also cause damage or it used to cause damage um, for in especially places like the Kennebec River, which we'll get to. This, I, I don't know if I'll ever see something like this again. This was the uh, winter of 2014-15 at Rockland Breakwater. And I zoomed in on this. Uh, this breakwater was frozen over for about six weeks straight. And to me, it looked like the surface of the moon, kind of. It was just like really all of the, the bubbling on the breakwater. The blizzard had just had some interesting formations of ice form on it. And it stayed that way, like I said, for six weeks. And the interesting thing about it was it wasn't slippery. And I don't know if that's because of the salt in the air, uh, but you could actually walk out there. The only thing that became a problem later as it started to melt was you could actually put your foot through some of the cracks, which could be really dangerous. But uh, I don't know if I'll ever see something quite like that again. And the picture of the breakwater lighthouse uh, with ice over it after a storm. We talk about those ice flows. There's stories about the keepers at this is a doubling point, uh, these ice cakes coming ashore. Uh, they would wreak havoc in the river. As, as anybody familiar with the, uh, the Kennebec River knows the velocity of the water coming down and is, is pretty fast. So if you have these ice cakes floating around out there, you got your small boat caught in one of them, it could really be problematic. And there were stories about keepers from Perkins Island and Squirrel Point and what have you having to cope with these kind of, um, as, the, as the ice would start to break up above in Augusta and in, you know, up above Bath and it would come down river. And even today, not in the last couple of years, but normally the Coast Guard will do ice breaking, like in March it's scheduled and they'll break that ice up. And for a few days later, that ice comes down and the size of some of those ice cakes is amazing. And then ice storms, this was taken in 2013. It was actually, December 23rd, it was the, the big, not the 98 type ice storm that Maine suffered from, but the third, 2013 ice storm was still bad in certain areas. And it caused a lot of problems and people were out power for a few weeks. Um, so in this case, you can see the ice even weighed down. If you look closely at the lantern, it weighed down the emergency light. So the emergency light came down, which obviously should have been above the lantern, but in this case, uh, the ice weighed it down. And then I talk about the artistic aspects of lighthouses. This was looking at the VRB25 in Rockland Breakwater through ice on the outside of the lantern pane. And just, just scenes like this, you know, I just am drawn to them. And it just makes me think about lighthouses in so many different ways. But of course, Arctic sea smoke, which I think anybody who loves photographing lighthouses in the winter, this is like the dream. We didn't have any this year, sadly, but you get a couple days, sometimes more than a couple each winter when that temperature and the, the, the sea temperature is all, it all comes together to make some magic out of the water. This was taken atop of Al's headlight looking out over Penobscot Bay. And this was taken from the Rockland breakwater and to see the vapor coming in uh, before the sun rose and just the ominous feel about this. And then just the steaming and you know, often you'll see a ferry, the seven o'clock ferry is leaving Rockland to go to Vinyl Haven, uh, just disappear into this. And it adds to the mystery of Arctic sea smoke. This photo was taken at West Quaddy Headlight, uh, looking over out over Grand Manan Channel. And just the, you know, because the sea smoke gets backlit, I just love how it, it appears like fire. Burning cold is what I like to say. And this particular one, this is just, I don't know, it was a year or two ago. It wasn't too long ago. Uh, this was actually in the afternoon. And I remember my son and I, we, we knew the temperatures on this particular day we were getting very, very cold. And typically, as most people know, sea smoke is a, is a morning thing. Uh, but on this afternoon, um, this, it was actually that cold where the sea smoke appeared in the afternoon as the sun was setting out in front of Marshall Point Light. Again, it's one of those scenes you ask yourself, will I ever see something like that again? Rockland Breakwater is one of my favorite. It's close by, so during sea smoke, um, I, I'll enjoy going there, making one of the stops because it, it just offers uh, the harbor itself. Uh, I think the temperatures and the way the water in the harbor, the way it moves in and out of the harbor, it's always great uh, for drama there at the breakwater.
And this one, again, taken, this was actually taken from the Proc Marine area uh, on Front Street looking out over Al's head. And to me, that that's the, the scene in the sky with the vapor is just like almost apocalyptic. And it was just amazing. And of course, there's fog. And we all know fog. It moves in and out. It can stay for days on end, maybe. Uh, but I, only on occasion have I been able to see fog rolling quite like this. Maybe Jen out on Monhegan has seen it, you know, being out on the island has seen it more. But it's not often I see fog move in like this on the inner part inside of Owl's Head and move towards Rockland Harbor, where it just cascaded upon itself and continued to move and, and just to say, just swallow up the visibility like that. And it did it rather quickly. It was actually amazing to see it on this day. And then this being outside looking down towards, you might say towards Matinicus, uh, Matinicus Island, just looking out and zooming in on the fog bank out there and just seeing the lobster boats out front. And then you'd see these boats coming in and out of the fog. And uh, it's, uh, when I see fog like that, with the, when you can see blue sky and the sun, it's, it's very amazing to, to watch. But of course, we also see fog like this on so many occasions, this being at West Quaddy Head. I said, when, and so I like to say, when nothing can be discerned by sight, everything must be, quote, seen through sound. And you know, for those not familiar, West Quaddy Headlight was one of the first lights to have what they called like a, a fog signal cannon in 1820. And I often wonder how, you know, that's a, it's a dangerous thing for a keeper to put the charge in and to sound that also not, not efficient at all. And I also wonder, like, in, in those moist conditions, how did they keep the charge from really just getting screwed up? But yeah, West Quaddy, one of those places like Moose Peak and Seguin Island and Petit Manan, you almost could say they manufacture fog. A uh, photo of Little River Lighthouse in the fog. And that's the other thing, you know, keep in the day when they had the clockworks that they had to wind for their fog bell and how every four to six hours, maybe days, maybe weeks on end, uh, and how the families would also help with something like that. But you can imagine how that wore on them, not only the duty, but also just the, uh, the emotion. River. Well, on this day, uh, we were going to service Egg Rock, and we actually did on this day, but it was as we approached you, as we're off of Egg Rock, we couldn't see anything. As we move closer, it starts to emerge, so to speak, out of the fog. And that's always a fascinating experience to watch the lighthouse, quote, emerge from the fog as you draw closer. And this is Moose Peak, I mentioned. Moose Peak is one of those places that literally, as you saw, fog, fog records for uh, the lighthouse service. or something that I always look for. In this case, this is in the lantern at Owl's Head Light. So we have something here, water in the lantern. It's not, so, it, we don't want something like that to happen, but it had, had some rain blowing from the west. It came in the, the uh, gallery door. And, but in that, for I just looked and saw the reflection of the lens and it was just something I had to take. And before I wiped up the water then thereafter, but that's the fun stuff. That's the fun stuff of seeing, can, I, can you challenge yourself to see something different that you may not have seen before? And this was a reflection of the uh, lighthouse at Pemico Point in the bell tower. And as many of you know, the bell tower was destroyed on January 10th at Pemico Point Light. So um, we all hope and they're able to. It just. I took this perspective on purpose. Now, this was a large ice cake. It was taller than I was. It was over six and a half feet tall. But I got down to be able to show on, you know, on the ground to be able to show uh, something that I wanted to be able to convey of, of, of the ice. And then with that, this other one is also a doubling point. And this one I actually got down and laid on the ground because a doubling point, when the tide rolls in at places like that, it'll freeze with a thin layer. And then as it goes out, it breaks. And a lot of times this thin ice will be uh, jaggedly placed up in the air 
So I, I got down and, and looked through that and took a picture of the lighthouse that way, just for the heck of it, just to see something different. But again, these are the things that keep it so much fun. And this one was a ice cake with this hole in it at Squirrel Point. And it was along the shore. I had a tough time getting around to it, but I got inside, I, didn't, I shouldn't say inside, but around to this backside, which was kind of hollowed out and looked through this hole to be able to, to capture the scene of the lighthouse at Squirrel Point. And to me, just a personification of winter and isolation. And then perspectives, how about this one? Queen Mary two outside of Rockland Harbor with the breakwater light in front. Just, you could just imagine like if, if that, sh that cruise ship hit the lighthouse, it would be lights out for the lighthouse. And it just, you think about how, how the vessels have just grown in size over the years. And it's just an amazing scene to be able to see that ship uh, with the lighthouse in the foreground. And perspectives also, uh, in this case, on the south end of Val's Head, low tide, uh, these were rocks in the foreground and just being able to use that uh, to give almost like a, a canvas because there was no wind on this morning when I was out there. And it was, to me, it was like a painting almost what I was seeing, the colors running in the, uh, the tidal water there. And it was just uh, something that caught my eye. And then of course, something like, again, showing winter with the icicles coming off the roof of the oil house at Al's Head Light. And then the tides. The tides are something that, you know, keepers would run their lives around. You, could, you couldn't leave a site or you had to come back on a high tide or what have you. Uh, the Rockland Breakwater is over the years for a couple of reasons. Uh, the South End has been seeing itself being submerged or inundated more and more, partly because of the uh, rising sea levels, partly because the breakwater, the further out you go, has settled over time. And uh, uh, on this occasion, uh, just being low to the breakwater, trying to show the fact that the tide has uh, quote conquered the breakwater on these types of occasions. But I also like to look at the lenses. I'm fascinated by the lenses. On the left uh, is the is this the close up of the uh, third order Fresnel lens at West Quadi Head, and how all of the different uh, designs and of the lens itself as it's refracting, reflecting inside. And that optic is uh, inside there, it's a, a sea light optic now. This is the new LED types that are inside Fresnel lenses. They finally have a, a, an optic that is compatible for, for a Fresnel lens. And that's what you're looking at there. Well, on the right is a, um, it's like a fourth order square lens. Some of you have been to the main lighthouse museum know exactly what I'm talking about. On well, this day, as I was looking at it, and I, I was just, I was amazed at how it, uh, if you look at the bullseye and you trace it back, it was almost like a time warp to me. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but that's what I was seeing in that and thinking about how much history passed through that Fresnel lens when it was in use. And in a way, like in a, in a sense, that history is kind of still there. So uh, here's a lens inside a museum and it got, my, it got me thinking about things. But of course, focus on the light. We have, a, we have lighthouses, they gotta shine their light. Uh, this is a top Rockland breakwater at sundown. And there's nothing like being in a lantern uh, as the sun is setting. And I think about how the keepers, I know in Connie Small's book uh, that she wrote, I love that book. And she talks about being in the lantern when they would light up at night at sundown and how she liked to watch the other lights come on thereafter around her. This is in West Quaddy Head light with, as the, uh, the Fresnel lens is, like I said, a third order and it flashes twice every 20 seconds. And what's so amazing is it flashes and you and it's just like pure grandeur and then it goes dark and you can't see anything. And then it flashes again. And it's just, it's quite a, an experience. Uh, this is close up of the fourth order for now lens at, at Al's Headlight. I think a lot of us are the same way. We can't get enough of these lenses. They're, they're gems or treasures. Uh, we want to examine them, not just from a distance, but we just want to take a look at them and look up and down and just kind of let your eyes just roll all over these, these masterpieces. Looking inside the fourth order at Al's head um, from the back uh, entry door into the lens. And then on the right is the uh, is looking inside the VRB 25 at Moose Peak Light, which has now been replaced by an LED. But what fascinated me with this one was 
was the idea that we never know every one of these flashes. You didn't know during the course of time as these lighthouses shone the light, which gleam actually caught the eye of a mariner who really needed it. And it's like every one of them is important. Not every one of them is ever going to be seen, but every one of them is important. And it was just, to me, that's what I saw when I saw in this photo was that every flash has a reason. And then just the concept of artistic, this is looking down into a VRB 25 and the uh, acrylic lenses. I know a lot of people say, well, they don't have the beauty of a Fresnel and that's true. Um, but now with the advent of LEDs, I think the VRB 25 suddenly look amazing. And these acrylic lenses were, were actually manufactured off the same principles of a Fresnel lens. So that I find that fascinating, but there's art even in modern equipment or what we co uh, the Coast Guard calls legacy equipment now. And this was the uh, 250 millimeter lens in dice headlight in Castine, which has been replaced now by a high watt LED. So uh, it, uh, these, th these types of things keep making history. The, the optics continue to change. And in some ways, I, I, uh, I think that's great because the lighthouses continue to show that they have relevance. If, if, they, if they did not keep changing with society, lighthouses would fade. So I think the fact that uh, the technology, we can embrace it. Um, we might miss the old ways, and, and I certainly do. I'm one of those. But at the same time, we're carrying the lighthouses forward and there still activates navigation. I think that's awesome. And just a close-up of a six-place lamp changer that the Coast Guard uses in some of their legacy beacons. And I, I just, on this day, it was, it was a little cold in the lantern and the way the moisture was playing off that lamp as it flashed was something that caught my eye. And then this is a, an eight-tier modern LED that's in Marshall Point light. And these are not aesthetically pleasing. They don't rotate. Um, it's something, the rotation is something I totally love and miss at some of these places. Um, but I also have to say it's an incredible technology nonetheless. And we celebrate lights being lit. The, uh, I used a wide angle on this uh, one of the first order Fresnel lens at Seguin Island on the left. Uh, otherwise, there was no way I was going to capture that. And even with the wide angle, uh, I was having trouble getting it into the, to the frame. Um, to see a first order Fresnel lens in place working is just, it's a treat. It's, it's something that you just have to just, you're in awe of. It's total awe. And the picture on the right is at West Quadi Headlight. And then this picture, it was taken at outside at sundown. And again, this reminded me of Connie Small talking about how they would light up at night. And I imagined, I asked myself, you know, how many sunsets the keepers see, but how much could they actually pay attention to them either? Because back then it took 15 minutes to a half hour to prep your light, to get ready, to have it on by sundown. Uh, you, you wonder, I'm sure they were sneaking peeks of that as they were working. How could you not when you'd see a sky burst in the color? But uh, keepers would be busy at this time in the day, back in the day. Time is another thing that fascinates me. I say time may be tracked by the calendar and measured by the clock, but it is motion that is the very essence of time. The passage entails sight set forward and ambitions on rushing into life's unfolding. Uh, and this was a picture to me that kind of represented time, uh, the victory chimes, which we unfortunately no longer have in Rockland. Uh, but the Victory Chimes, you know, in, its, in its better days in Rockland, sailing by the lighthouse. And this is of the uh, ferry Everett Libby coming back from Matinicus Island. And it comes back past Alshead regularly during the summer, a few times a week. But I, and this day on this lantern, I was in the lantern watching it go by. And I said to myself, it was reminding me of time. So as it passed by the lighthouse and got behind trees, I could no longer see it, of course. But the Everett Libby was still steaming on its way towards Rockland. And it was just kind of like time for us in history. Time is just, to me, like one big continuum. We're in this present time and we don't see the history that was prior, but it's still there. It's all there. And I see that when I look at these vessels plying the waters. And this was just a cool one of uh, the uh, Stephen Tabor and the Victory Times passing by Rockland Breakwater Light a couple years ago. And I've got two pictures. This one from Al's Headlight. This is the 175 uh, foot cutter Abby Burgess, the buoy tender, home ported in Rockland. 
And to me, this is some of the lantern pain magic. When you're in the lantern rooms of these lights, if the sun is just right and it starts reflecting the shadow. So that shadow of that island is behind the light. It's, it's, the, it's to my back. It was of Monroe Island. And the Abbey's going through with the sun, the way it was uh, glimmering through this, the sunlight in the lantern. It reminded me almost like a time warp. Anybody who's seen like space movies and stuff like that, and you see these time warps, it's like, it's like there's the Abbey going through a time warp of, of sorts in a way. And this is the Abbey Burgess in viewing the same kind of mindset as it passes Rockland Breakwater Light. I love the way the lantern panes can really uh, work their quote magic on the moments when the sun is, is lower in the sky. And then sometimes time just flies by. And this was just for fun. Uh, the, uh, the Coast Guard uh, helicopter was in Rockland and they had been working some training with the station, the 47 foot motor lifeboats. And I could hear it coming back out and was gonna be you know, departing Rockland. I never had any idea they would be you know, in that low. So I'm zooming in on this, of course, but it was such a cool thing to see. And to me, that's like time flying by. So it was just a fun one. The spiral staircase and long shadows speak of time, but so too do the echoing footsteps that reverberate inside a lighthouse when we climb the towers today. And there's nothing like being in a lighthouse uh, during the evening when you turn on the lights in the tower and you see the shadows. So on the left, you're seeing the inside of Little River Light. On the right, you're looking at Pemico Point Light. In this picture, when I took it, I saw the past and present holding hands, the reflection of course being the past. And it, uh, to me, when I'm at these lighthouses, I'm enjoying them, but I'm also trying to do a lot of thought, a lot of pondering, uh, and again, bringing history, bringing weather, bringing all sorts of things into my love of lighthouses. Reflections in windows present a sense of looking back in time. Whitehead Island light. So this is the window in the Whistle House. I'm just looking back at the lighthouse. And reflections in tide pools are another kind of window into time. So I'm at low tide, I'm down below Bass Harbor Head Light. And some of those tide pools, if the light's right, just fascinate me looking into them. And wondering too, you know, how many children played at these lighthouses. And oftentimes we spend a lot of time in the tide pools and just wondering how much they wondered as, wandered as they looked into these types of things. I'm sure they were playing with their toys and doing other things. Maybe they weren't thinking like that, but uh, still you wonder. And just a couple more reflections of both of these at Portland Headlight. Marshall Point light on the left, just this little uh, patch of water left and was able to find the reflection in that and scroll back on the right here. And again, with the Kennebec, as I'm watching this, the, the, uh, the reflection, sometimes you couldn't even discern it because the water's moving so fast. And again, it kind of reminded me of time flowing by. Indian Island light at the entrance to Rockport Harbor. It is a decommissioned lighthouse, but um, definitely one that's familiar with those who fly the waters up in the mid coast. And then just for fun, you know, again, the reflections are so amazing and watch, um, almost like a, it's to me, it's an adventure to watch them uh, fold onto each other. So Rockland Breakwater on the left, Spring Point Light on the right. Again, this just makes an experience at a lighthouse so much more fun. And then I like to tell people, look up and down and all around at a lighthouse. I find at low tide, the amazing scenes and windows into different worlds that you can see. So you have these lighthouses there that are standing so regal, majestic, but then uh, also what is all around? And I find that uh, it just adds to my experience, adds, adds to memories. And of course, isolation. This is at Mount Desert Rock. Uh, this is one of the trips flying in to service the lighthouse. And you're looking out and you're like, that's, uh, you keep going, you'll, you'll reach Europe at some point. There's just nothing out there. And you think about keepers, this is about 24, 26 miles off the coast. And it's not very high off the, off the water there. So above sea level. And we probably, anybody who's read history of lighthouses in Maine knows that a place like Mount Desert Rock and other lighthouses like Boone Island and others, the keepers and their families would often go to the tower during storms uh, that were very big that they might fear that might take away, sweep away the keeper's house. In this case at Mount Desert Rock, there were 
there are stories of keepers going into the uh, lighthouse to and hoping it that it held against big storms. And then this is Mount Desert Rock looking back at Acadia. And I just, I look at this and I just, I said to myself, look at the divide, the, ex the expanse, the, the sea there is like a dividing line. Um, the, the keepers had no hope of being able to cross you. As a keeper, you weren't going to be able to row, especially prior to, to uh, motorized boats and things, but even with small boats, you would never go that far uh, back to land. So you're looking back and you're like in this sort of prison away from everybody. And I wonder how many keepers just looked at that and kind of lamented the fact that, hey, life's going on back on the mainland and here I am stuck out on the rock. So picture Libby Island from, as, as we're coming in on a winter's day. And again, it just, uh, to me, you get a sense of isolation and the elevation at Libby Island is always amazing too. Um, but you can see where the whistle house is in the foreground at Libby Island. And during the January storms that we just had in 2024, there was evidence you could see brick and everything washed up, up above that oil house. The seas had come up some 60 some feet there and washed over the grass area between the whistle house and the lighthouse. Uh, I was actually stunned to see the power of such a storm do like do something like that. I mentioned Boone Island and so many of us know the stories of uh, that were associated with Boone Island prior to a lighthouse being there, but just after a lighthouse was built there and how many times storms would threaten this place and keepers and their families running into the lighthouse to escape the fury of a storm, again, hoping their tower held. But this is Maine's tallest lighthouse at 133 feet above, uh, uh, above the ground. So our highest lighthouse in Maine is Seguin Island. At a, it, it shines a slight 186 feet above sea level, but the tower itself is like 53 feet tall. But Boone Island is over this rock. Uh, it's like 32 acres. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just amazing to think about the fury of the storm. Also being that far out and seeing, you know, 20, 30 foot seas um, just pounding a place like this. It just rock uh, and uh, imagine families just having to uh, just live each day, forget their chores, just enduring each day that far away from people. Um, Matinicus Island is about five miles away to the northwest of Matinicus Rock, but even at that, and that would have been within reach, of course, for, for the keepers on Matinicus Rock, but when the seas kick up, you weren't even going to get to Matinicus Island. Saddleback Ledge in, uh, on the east side of Penobscot Bay is another one of these wave swept lights. And the first keeper there, Keeper Hopkins and his wife, they, they lived inside the tower with nine children or seven children, uh, but there was nine of them total. And I just cannot imagine being in the side Saddleback Ledge and seeing the tower is really not that big. The floors inside the lighthouse are no longer there. They It's actually very hot, it's hollow inside and just a staircase that goes up to the lantern. But I tried to imagine what it was like to have nine people living inside Saddleback Ledge. Aerial view of Petit Manan Island, which is one of the seabird refuges, uh, along with Matinicus Rock, the two lighthouses that occupy the, some of the seabird refuges in, in Maine. Uh, so in the, in the summertime, you will have the razor bills, the terns, the puffins on a place like Petit Manan. Uh, but again, this is another one of those stations that would have been very lonely uh, although there would have been multiple keepers and families on this during their heyday, which probably helped a little bit. Another wave swept rock, halfway rock light at the, uh, in the middle of, at the outer reaches of Casco Bay between Cape Small and Cape Elizabeth, literally about halfway. And uh, this lighthouse took some serious damage, not the tower itself, but uh, the boathouse and keepers dwelling on the backside and the, the, the 180 foot uh, boat ramp that was there uh, sustained heavy damage during the January storms. So walking in the steps of the keepers and their families, to me, that's how I see it, uh, both when I visit a lighthouse, but also when I'm working a lighthouse with the Coast Guard. So for the Coast Guard today, obviously 
not lighthouse keepers. Uh, and for those who don't know, uh, the AIDS navigation teams were something the Coast Guard created. It was a it was actually the first team was actually created in 1973 in New Haven, Connecticut. There's about 64 uh, AIDS navigation teams in the country today. We have two in Maine. They were both created in 1976, so at Southwest Harbor in South Portland. And um, the Coast Guard back when they created them said they were basically the outgrowth of the lighthouse keeper. So here in Maine, this, the uh, teams were created in, like I said, 1976, but we still had some lighthouses that were staffed by keepers up until 1990 when the last one, Goat Island, was automated. So there was some crossover here. So though not lighthouse keepers, keepers of the light. And uh, the picture on the right shows the lighthouse service keepers, uh, the Coast Guard era in the 1950s, and three of us there a few years ago, the tradition of just keeping a light continues. And on occasion, we do some of the same chores. This is uh, uh, EM1 Max Ringstad uh, in the lantern at West Quaddy Head with the uh, old keeper. Uh, I believe this was at Halfway Rock. Uh, they're also uh, just sweeping out some of these chores that we see happening today. The picture on the left is on the uh, St. Croix Island. It's an international historic site between uh, Canada and the, and the United States up near Calais. And there's this monument there and keeper Elson Small and his wife Connie on the left with their friends uh, on the right. And it was this was this was probably 15 years ago. I remember we took the time to uh, sort of recreate that. And we did that here at Hare and Neck as well, because uh, one thing the AIDS navigation teams are very mindful of is their history. We realize that we're doing a lot of the same work in terms of keeping the lights and horns going. Again, it looks very different. Of course, we, nobody lives at these places like that anymore. But the idea of human hands still needed to uh, tend the lights, the concept is still there. Cleaning the lens. Uh, both of these were at West Quaddy Head Light. And... And the one on the left, Lubeck Channel, it's Connie Small and, and her friend, and my, my friend Mike there, we, we decided we're going to recreate that pose, and it was just a fun moment. But on the right, you have Keeper Stroud and Keeper Hill, different eras at Portland Head, and the AIDS and Navigation team, uh, the Lighthouse Techs, climbing up the stairs. And, and you say to yourself, how many times did the Lighthouse Keepers and their families climb those same stairs to basically do the same thing, make sure the light was watching properly? And of course, we can't like our, we can't look as well. And some Japanese moss at Dice Headlight. Uh, these are the types of things that really just make, I mean, I know anybody who takes pictures of, of lighthouses and it's anywhere serious is always looking for really cool scenes like this, but it's, it's the fun, it's, it makes it memorable. Marshall Point Light. And we're all waiting for spring, I'm sure. Uh, Brindle Point Light on the left at Islesboro and Fort Point Light at Stockton Springs. West Quaddy Head Light, move back. And this picture was, it's, it's one of those things where the wind was blowing hard this day. And the only way I could show it was the tall grass. And it was like very windy. And it was like, okay, I'm going to try to show wind. And it was the only way I could do it. So the grass is bending. And now we're going to go move into the uh, two books quickly here. Most of the images in Gleams and Whispers and Beacons of Wonderment were born out of what the scenes inspired in my heart and mind. Maybe it was a nod to history, the wow of the elements, nature's alluring glance, or splashes of romance. But whatever the reason, the views had to speak to me. When such times lifted the veil of the unknown, I endeavored to take prose and images and, quote, marry the moment in a lasting bond. And Gleams and Whispers, we'll go through six, I believe, images of this. And so these are quotes. Some of them are complete. Some of them are excerpted because they would just be too long for this. But in this one, salt water and a drop of time stir flights of fancy, solidifying a lasting memory in the heart that is impervious to being unremembered. And that's how I saw the, the granite there with the reflection, that noble light. Light, it guides, it fascinates, and it brings hearts nearer. Reflection of the fourth order lens at Al's head as the schooner American Eagle was uh, sailing back into Rockland. 
Imagination, when set free, will ascend to where eagles soar to a lofty place occupied only by a guiding light that burns bright across the ever restless expanse. Come see, come listen. And memories in time, like a ship in a bottle, never really go away inside an old lighthouse. And this is looking up at Boone Island light. Lighthouses have always been part real and part spiritual. Their physical attributes are readily seen and understood, but not so their symbolism and extraordinary essence. It is in their symbolism where lighthouses demonstrate their transcendence, eluding every undertaking by time and evolution to quell their relevance. And actually on this day, this was aboard the, um, uh, 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 the, uh, the name of it's escaping me, but out of Camden, we were on one of these cruises. And as the boat was turning around, uh, Captain Dominic was turning around the vessel, uh, the wake that it made really made an interesting, uh, almost like a painting for me to look at it and see the colors running. And so I decided to, to use it for something like this. Why do lighthouses standing sentinel amidst a sea of isolation captivate our imagination? Might it be the intrigue that envelops these distance lights is found in their uncanny ability to stir the soul and conflict the mind? Is it loneliness or contentment? Is it forsaken or liberating? Is it misery or happiness? And you know, you ask yourself the keepers, would they have asked themselves, some of them would have took all the positives. There would have been a few to say, oh, that's pretty negative. At a place like Matinicus Rock here, who knows? Solitude never walks alone at the lights for romance, mystery, and wonderment are always close by. And it's like I said, a visit to a lighthouse is not just simply a visit to a lighthouse. If you look around and see what else is there for you to discover. One does not need to reside at a lighthouse to live at a lighthouse, for they are deep emotional places where many feel more alive than at any other abode ever encountered. This was taken at Whitehead Island. And we'll cover six from Beacons of Wonderment. On an island, there's a deep rooted way of life. The ways are old and its abundance is of a different kind. There is freedom to relish and a hardiness sure to refine. Of course, anybody familiar with Monhegan Island Light knows that this is Monhegan. Alas, time, obsessed with haste, would sprint on into the future with a crude innovation and an insatiable desire for the self-acting. Reluctantly, keepers gave way to automated might at their lights. Lighthouses still stand tall, but as for their unattended glow and bellow, Maybe it's less about advancement and more about remembering what was. Wikis, I cannot otherwise reason why. And I was just pondering how lights have been so automated now and you wonder um, what keepers might have thought about something like that. Within the routine and amidst the familiar, amazingness is discovered between layers often paid no heed. And I know like we've been talking about throughout this presentation, you know, if you look around, down, up and around, you see these types of reflections and just other types of things. But there's a lot of people who visit a lighthouse and they never they never linger. They don't take their time. It's just something of like they see it and they go. And for a lot of people, that's good enough. But there are a lot of us who say we want a little bit more. And that little bit more is, is a lot of reward. Islands are bantam worlds under themselves, adorned in wild greens and buttressed by ancient ledges. These sanctuaries of serenity shimmer in allure upon a sea of restlessness. A blue expanse separating the worlds apart serves as a buffer from the unhindered disturbance and the guardian of their pristine essence. This taking at Seguin Island. Within this spiral of time, much in the way of lighthouse history still traverses. Such an inner sanctum is where the seen and unseen are conjoined evermore, sharing in the majesty of every unfolding moment and memory etched. Its amplitude is astounding, its lofty crown aglow indoors. And this is looking up uh, the inside the tower of Pemmican Point. U.S. Coast Guard lighthouse technicians carry the light forward into the night. Not the nights of a future unknown, but tonight, the only night that matters. In the tomorrows to come, their dedicated efforts will yield the same steadfast light, but a time-honored legacy is built only one way one day and one gleam at a time. That's my friend Chase, he's an he's a electrician's made first class and he's inside Dice Head Light on this picture. 
So cherish every gleam of light and doleful tone of the foghorn. Absorb every echo along a spiral ascent and the beauty that abounds from the glowing pinnacle aloft. For even in modernity, lighthouses are still adding to their stirring memoirs and weaving a heartwarming love story that has no end. Embrace the goodness of lighthouses that yet shines in ways both perceived and implied. Your heart will discern the balance. This was taken at Little River Light in Cutler. In the end, I do realize that I'm searching for something I will never fully discover. Despite that, I'm continually urged on by the notion that doors into the past can still be found in places where we least expect them. There is much in the way of joy on this journey of a lifetime. To me, joy is akin to light, a light not for the eyes, but rather the heart. This was on the schooner Bufflehead passing Rockland Breakwater some years back. So I just encourage everybody, never stop wondering. And that is my presentation. Thank you, Bob. That was wonderful. and Just beautiful photos. I especially was drawn to the ones about the different weather, which might be, you know, being here on Monhegan, we're, we're so um, kind of at the whim of the weather. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, particularly spoke to me. But you know, I encourage people to drop questions in the Q&A. Nobody knows lighthouses inside and out better than Bob. So this is your chance to ask him some questions. Um, but while, you know, while people have a have a minute to do that, you know, can I just start by asking, how did you get involved with lighthouses in the first place? That's a great question. It was uh, it was in the early 90s. And it was just one of those, I, I grew up west of Philadelphia. And it was one of those things where it was like, I didn't really know lighthouses when I was young. I knew what a lighthouse was, but one day I just stumbled over, uh, we were on visiting in Delaware. Uh, I would later move to Delaware with the family, but we were visiting and I looked out and I saw what was Harbor Refuge Lighthouse, which is a mile and a half, on a mile and a half breakwater out in the Atlantic off of Cape and Lopen. And at that time in, in the early nineties, it looked pretty sad and I just wondered was anybody taking care of these lighthouses? And so I inquired and, you know, long story short was, that was at this point, it was still Coast Guard owned, um, but you realize that the Coast Guard was limited in their funds. So it inspired me to actually, actually help create an organization that at that point, uh, it was the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation at that time, uh, to help with not only Harbor Refuge, but eventually we added a couple more. Uh, so that's how it was really got in because I, I saw this lighthouse and, and I said, man, is anybody helping it? And that was that's how I got started. And so, um, you know, after all these years involved in the lighthouses, do you have any particular favorites, ones that you, you know, really look forward to visiting? Uh, yeah, I do, actually. I, I don't like to say I have a favorite lighthouse, but uh, my favorite lighthouse is Matinicus Rock. Uh, I'm drawn towards the ones... Uh, Mount Desert Rock. But I'll tell you, my second favorite is uh, Lubeck Channel Light. And I think part of that is uh, coming from the Delaware Bay where there were so many of those caisson lights. But I just am fascinated that face fascinated that somebody would live inside these caisson lighthouses, just, you know, circular walls. All you'd, if you, your exercise was out on that exterior gallery, walk, walk, working, yeah, walking in circles and making sure the, the hatches were down so you didn't fall through. Uh, but just imagine the, the, the monotony of living on something like that. So that's, I, for some reason, I, I like those lighthouses, but I think the offshore ones, um, the wave swept ones, they speak to me the most because um, it's why we, I think a lot of us like lighthouses. It's it's a little bit, as much as it can be dangerous, I think there's a little bit of a, as a, a lure in that and in, in that these people were dedicated to keeping a light burning bright in very in, inhospitable environments. So, uh, and battling the seas and then just that solitude. And sometimes that solitude would work in your favor and sometimes people probably hated it. But again, that's the conflicted part of lighthouses that I think draws us. So we, we have a couple of questions here from Guy Stever, who's a uh, regular Monhegan visitor and one of our star hey. volunteers here at Monhegan Museum. And one of his, and he's done quite a lot of research on our lighthouse. And one of his questions is, do you know where the nearest repository of District 1 yearly reports is in Maine? Ooh, no, <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, he might check with the first di district in Boston and ask okay. that question. That might be the place to start. 
And another question that Guy had is what kind of camera are you using? The pictures are gorgeous. I'm using a Nikon, but I gotta be honest with you. Sometimes I'm using, uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I use my iPhone sometimes. It depends on the circumstance. I can tell you this, when, when you're working these lights, especially when I'm doing Coast Guard work, you don't have time to bring out your camera. So it, the, thankfully the iPhones have, uh, in some cases have been so advanced now that on occasion, yeah, some of that's how you have to actually capture it. Now, of course, I'll, I'll use my Nikon when I really want to capture some of these real cool things and I have time to set those up. But if you're on the move and you're doing this work, you don't have time. And yet history is happening in front of you. I mean, what we do is happening. It's all unfolding really quick and you got a job to do. And you're in between saying, I got a job to do and I've got a split second for this or I got two minutes for this. And uh, it's so I use whatever tool is practical at the moment. So it's a mix of both. And it's just, to me, it's like, it, to me, it's more about the eye, what I'm seeing. Uh, and, and if you have a decent enough camera or, or, or even sometimes on an iPhone, um, yeah, you can, you can find some of these scenes that look great. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing, um, you know, these unique perspectives uh, that you have on lighthouses. Um, and I think we'll all come, come away from this, seeing lighthouses a little bit differently in the future. I, you know, that's, that's my biggest wish is that people, because we, sometimes with lighthouses, it's like, um, we love their history and all, but I, I, to how they attract new people into it, I think sometimes is, is, is some of these ways to be able to show people that maybe they're not so much in the history like we are. We love the history. But then you find out if you attract people in for other reasons, then all of a sudden they get exposed to history and they realize how rich and awesome it is. And so we can, so if, and then just for us long time people who've been in it, if it's just another way to enjoy it, so be it. So yeah, so I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a good Thank night, everyone. Good night.